Okay, I'd like to welcome everybody to lesson number 10 on the book of Daniel. Uh, last week, for those that were here or those that went and made up the, uh, the, the recording, yeah, we covered basically chapter, chapter 7, 1 through 8, and then we threw in a couple of more verses, 10 and 11. And really, we talked about the four beasts and kind of superficially what, what they were. But we also started last week the discussion of prophecy and probability. You say, well, this is not a statistics class, is it? No, it's not a statistics class. But prophecy and po probability go hand in hand. And I'm not going to go into the detail again. We can go back and listen to it. But the, the fact is, when you look at, we did a study for the case that, uh, of Easter, and, and it was said that if Jesus would have filled only five prophecies, that it would have been like a, a, a statistical prophecy, a, a probability of like one over 10 with uh, 50 zeros. So it'd be that small of probability. If he, if he did one in, he did 10 probabilities or 10 prophecies, then it'd be something like one with a hundred and something zeros underneath it. Jesus fulfilled a hundred prophecies, a hundred during the Passion Week alone. And so when you look at that, and several of our commentators wanted to focus on it, because if there's no further proof of the Bible that it's from God, there's no better way to prove it than it's statistically, humanly impossible for anybody to make that kind of prophecy come true. It has to be someone who has the future, knows what the future is in order to predict it that accurate. So that's how we finished up last week. We went through the, that, the first part. But Annette and I went going through this, we hit a lot of commentators that they brought out kind of a note to us that we thought it was important to share with our group. And, and that is, we're addressing a lot of different commentators. Uh, we've got Calvinists, we've got uh, even some probably feel-good ministers and uh, some, uh, Jewish. some Jewish. And so we, we have a lot of people we follow and the fact is, this came from one of them. Commentary started around 400 AD. Both the Christian commentaries as well as the Jewish commentaries. And so we have over 1,600 years of very, very knowledgeable people inspired by the Holy Spirit. And we should be leveraging that. Uh, Lane mentioned this one, some communication is, it's always, I have it in heart as well. As iron sharpens iron, one man sharpens another. With all that said, what Annette and I are trying to do is offer you these perspectives and let the Holy Spirit guide you as to where you come out with it. And you, you know, I've said this over, we don't want anybody to say, well, he said it must be true. No, we're trying to present the facts. And from that point, maybe the Holy Spirit will guide you in the same direction or different direction. So we just wanted to reiterate that because it came out so much in the commentary that we were listening to really this week. So with that, we'll start with uh, seven uh, verses nine through 11. And watch till thrones were put in place and the ancient of days was seated. His garment was white as snow and the hair of his head was like pure wool. His throne was a fiery flame, its wheels a burning fire. A fiery steam issued and came forth from before him. A thousand thousands ministered to him. 10,000 times 10,000 stood before him. The court was seated and the books were opened. I watched then because of the sound of the pompous words which the horn was speaking, I watched till the beast was slain and its body destroyed and given to the burning flames. So my first question for you are, what are these thrones and what comprises the seated court? And uh, it, I, I'll bring up, we, we use the New King James Version for our scriptures that we present to you. Um, I believe that in the King James Version, it says that the thrones were thrown down cast. or cast down. Um, and that sounds, um, it, it sounds a little bit, violent right the, this is is more they say the new king james more accurately interprets it that the thrones were established so what do you think these thrones are kingdoms kingdoms is a is the answer okay anybody else have a get a, a thought so 
we've been talking about 10 horns. We talked about last week, 10 horns are 10 kings. So some people might look at this and say, oh, I watched the thrones come down. Maybe those belong to the 10 kings. And we'll say, no, we don't believe that that's true. Um, I think that if there were 10 thrones for those 10 kings, they would have said, I watched and 10 thrones were put in place. So let's say it's not the thrones of the, um, the 10 horns. Notice that they go into a description after the thrones to the Ancient of Days. And so in reading this description, we immediately go to, our thought would go to the book of Revelation and John's um, description of what he saw. And remember, he saw 26 thrones. He saw, he saw 26 thrones, a throne for God, um, one for Jesus. And then he saw 24 thrones with the elders seated upon them. Now, an interesting thing that somebody brought up is notice, so, so we think that, that that would be the court being held. Remember that the 24 elders represent, they're an allusion to the church. So the 24 elders would represent the church. So I think this court being seated is God and Jesus and the 24 elders. Um, notice, uh, remember when John was discussing in Revelation about the thrones, he saw the 24 elders seated on the thrones. And it's curious or it's interesting, Daniel doesn't mention seeing anyone there. And any guess why perhaps, he might have just not mentioned it because we know we learned last week that every detail um, from his dream is not included. But if he did not see anybody seated on the throne, any idea why not? No guesses? The thought would be that if the 24 elders do refer to the church or an illusion of the church or a representation of the church, the church hadn't really been discussed or um, was not a part of the Old Testament. And so these seated elders would maybe not be seen by Daniel because they were not yet established. And that's just a thought. And I thought that was a really good point to make. So the next question, which is not very difficult to figure out probably, is who is this Ancient of Days that's sitting at the head of the court? Come on, that one's easy, y'all. Who's the Ancient of Days? God the Father. Yep, absolutely. It's God the Father. Of almost all the commentators agree that it's God the Father, uh, because it speaks of judgment and white garments, which uh, speaks of purity and wool-like hair. Speaks of wisdom. Fiery thrones uh, talks about the authority. So it's pretty much most people say it's obviously God the Father, but they are there are commentators that's arguing this is Christ, not God the Father. And I don't particularly agree with that, but I'm putting that out as some of, some of them argue that it's not God the Father. Uh, if it was Christ, I don't think, and this is just my opinion, I'm not, I don't think John would make, I mean, uh, Daniel would make the distinction between the Ancient of Days and the Son of Man. He has two separate distinctions in the scripture that's coming up. We haven't hit it yet. But the fact is, he wouldn't have made reference to that if we thought that this was really Christ. I think it, it, it very much shows that this is probably God the Father, and that's where the consensus on. Now, the thousand who ministered to him, you have any idea who that is? The angels? That's right. Most people agree it's the angelic beings that are worshiping. What about the 10,000 times 10,000 that stood before him? Most people think that's humanity. That's all the saved, saved saints. And so the angels are represented in the first number count, the angelic beings. The second is all the saints that are represented. I'm throwing that out because these numbers are there, and that was the only thing that we got from any commentators describing who are who could possibly be those numbers. 
not that important. We know everybody there is still, they worship God. That's the, that's the whole purpose of being there. Um, before I go on to the next scripture, I'm just going to point out this last bit. I didn't really come up with a question for this, but we easily could have asked you the, dif the, the difference between um, this fourth beast and the other three, but just notice that he stood there and the, the, the horn which is speaking, he's watching and, and, and you're watching the horn, but he watched until the beast was slain, the body was destroyed and it was given to the burning flame. Remember that, because that's where you can bring that back up probably later in discussion, um, which is different from this scripture uh, about uh, verses 12 through 13, where it says, as for the rest of the beasts, they had their dominion taken away, yet their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. I was watching in the night visions and behold, one like the son of man coming with the clouds of heaven. He came to the ancient of days and they brought him near before him. So who is the son of man? I think Dave just told you, but who would like to say, who is the son of man? It is Jesus. Uh, and we're going to lump these two questions together. They probably should have all been one question. And who is the son of man? And what's the significance of the title? Um, Jesus adopted this phrase for himself um, during his ministry. He used, um, referred to himself as the son of man, probably more than any other phrase that he used to describe himself. Um, when he told the Pharisees that called himself the son of man before the Pharisees, um, quite certainly or, or quite assuredly, I'm quite certain that they knew he was referencing back. They would know the book of Daniel. They would know that he, that the book of Daniel is talking about the Messiah, the son of man. And when Jesus calls himself the son of man, I think that they would take that as uh, back part of his blasphemy is when he said, I am, um, that, that would be part of why they um, right. connived or whatever to go ahead and crucify him. Uh, because he was being called or point, pointing to himself as the son of man. But anytime he returned or discussed his second coming, every time in the scripture when Jesus did that through Matthew, several places in Matthew, when he was talking about his second coming, he referred to himself as the son of man. And during the study of uh, the, the gospel of John, this came up. And again, I'm just throwing it out for information's sake. What's the difference between the son of man and the son of God? You ever thought about that? Because Christ refers to him both as himself as the son of God and also as the son of man. You have any idea what the difference of those two things are? Well, he's the son of God and he's the son of man through David, King, um, the lineage of David, King David. Yeah. He is the seed of David, right? And he is the seed of God. So mm -hmm. he's he's both the son of, of man and the son of God. And so that's accurate. Some people say he refers to the son of man and he uses that to describe his humanity. And when he says he's the son of God, he's describing his deity. So he uses his humanity and his deity differently depending on how he used son of man or son of, son of God. And, and remember, Christ came as a man, fully human and fully God. So th this is how some say they differentiate between him as a man and him as actually the son of God. So I just throw that out because we have that term here. It's the first time it's used is in the Old Testament. And, and like Nett said, Christ used it all over the place in the Gospels. So. Okay. The, yeah. Um, I was thinking, I was trying to go back in my memories here, but you just said that this is the first time the Son of Man was used in Daniel? In, in the Old Testament, I think that was what we were told. I didn't do the research, I, didn't, didn't verify it. I recently read something on that, and that was my recollection. Uh, and it was the first time, uh, I might be wrong on this, but that the Son of Man was equated to the Messiah. I think that's that, correct, too. I'm going to look that up, and I'll let, I'll let y'all know. 
But I think it is, Daniel was, I thought we heard that that was the first time this was you, this description of the Messiah was used. I, th I think that's correct. And, and the, one of the reasons for that is um, the Jews' expectation was this person that was going to deliver them, this Messiah was, was going to be a man. He was not going to be God. So that would make sense for them to, um, excuse me, to use that term son of man. Right. Yeah, and I think it's pretty obvious that the Jews recognized this is referring to the Messiah when Jesus called himself Son of Man. That was, that's obvious when you look at the Gospel of John. All right, this next question. Uh, obviously, this is what, what's happening in Daniel right now is the coronation of Jesus Christ getting his throne. We, we'll see that as we go through it. But is this coronation of Christ his ascension or his second coming? And we're going to move to really it's his second coming. But the reason why I ask this question, and I'm not looking for an answer because we had people split. And it says that Christ was delivered unto, brought uh, unto the ancient of days. In other words, it came before the ancient of days. So he was brought up to God. And so they use this last piece of this scripture to say that this is really his ascension, and it's not talking about the second advent or second coming at all. I can't see that because it's obvious from the way, way Daniel has done this is that he's coming from heaven in the clouds. He's coming from the clouds, from heaven, not from earth, up to heaven. Remember, the decision, the, the decision, decision uh, is basically he brought, was brought up in the clouds from earth to heaven. And that's not what it's describing here at all, in my opinion. But we're just letting you know we have differences on which, what that really means. I particularly think it is his second coming. The ascension has nothing to do with this. Go ahead, Jen. Because the, the context here is this is the picture of the white throne judgment at the end Absolutely. of the I'm not tribulation, end of the yeah. millennium. So it doesn't make sense that it'd be the um, ascension. And it certainly doesn't make sense it'd be his second coming because he comes to earth for that. So right. I, I don't even see it as a coronation either. I'm not sure what this event is supposed to be other than a picture of the white throne judgment that uh, Daniel's getting to see. And that's a good point. Well, I had a very good point. Mm -hmm. It could be. That wasn't brought up. So, uh, again, that's thinking, a good point. Yeah, I was thinking it's two descriptions of the same person, just in two different times. Not necessarily referring to the time, but the person. Yeah, and that's possible, too. One thing that as we move down into the scripture... The, he, the coronation is definitely there. We don't see it here, but we will see it later. So that's why they think that this ties back to the script, the scripture, just a few, few uh, verses down. So we'll see that in just a second. But with that, we'll move to the next set of scripture. Then to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom, the one which shall not be destroyed. I, Daniel, was grieved in my spirit within my body, and the visions of my head troubled me. I came near to one of those who stood by and asked him the truth of all this. So he told me and made known to me the interpretation of these things. So the first question here is, what is the characteristics of the final kingdom that's promised here? And before I go there, you remember last week we kind of said, if Daniel's saying something's going to happen and it's in, the, it's in the future, it's probably going to happen just the way he said it. <laughs> so he is everything he nailed because history shows he was 100% owned. So what do you think the characteristics of the promised final kingdom is? Because they're given to you here. Could you state your question again? 
What are the characteristics of the final kingdom? What will it look like? What does it consist of? From this scripture, as described in the scripture. Right. The final kingdom, all things that were lost by Adam are restored. Everything. Yeah. And so this, to me, we're looking like uh, a reference to the period that follows the um, millennium. I, I believe you're, yeah, mm -hmm. I believe you're correct. Remember, he's, he's prophesizing end time, including the millennium and the eternity of heaven, the new heaven after millennium. So this is, this is likely both. But yeah. if you want to look at it, really, it's Jesus will have absolutely absolute authority. It says given to him, that's Christ, the, the dominion, glory, and kingdom. He was given everything. That all peoples and nations will serve him. All will be obedient to him. His dominion will be an everlasting dominion. Again, that's past the millennium. That's forever. and shall not pass away. So in his, his kingdom will be one that will never be destroyed. And we stop and think about that. And I don't want to get too out in left field. Look at where we are today with all the crises we have going on within the world, within the United States, within everything that's happening. You look at the, the attempts of a one world economy, a one world currency, you got Bitcoin out there, if you hadn't heard of that, altcoin out there, you've got all these technologies and you've got uh, immorality everywhere. Christianity is probably going backwards. Uh, so you look at all the issues, man, isn't this a comfort to get this kind of promise from God himself that we're gonna be in an everlasting kingdom and this, all this earth is temporal it passes away. This is the truth we really can put our heart and soul in. This is why we can walk around and still not be depressed by all the rest of the junk that's going on. Because the fact is, we have this promise of truth from God. And so that that really struck a, stru a string with me looking at this and knowing how you know, we, we're going through all the tribulations that we're seeing on earth today. As Annette said, we think we're in the end times, but we thought we were in the end times before. And we're going to get why we're not there yet in just a minute. So, so I have a question. It doesn't really say here, um, but we know it from, from knowing our, our scripture. Do you think when Christ comes, that's something that's going to, people are going to be surprised and say, oh, what? Christ came already? Do you think it will take anybody by surprise or that people will be unaware of his return? Nope. 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 Okay. <laughs> Short That's answer. A simple, That's a simple answer. Um, I, this is going to be an amazing, incredible thing. And it doesn't go into the detail as Revelation does with the sound of thunder and the, and the trumpets sounding and things like that. But I think there will be no doubt when Christ returns. It's not going to be people wondering, like, has he come already? And, and the reason we bring, I know why this question is in here. Because we're going to show you some slides of some people that have a very different thought than we still can't wrap our head around. But, but they're feeling like everything has already happened and now we're in the new heaven and new earth. And so I would think we would know if Christ came back or not. And I know what he wants to say. You're going to say it again. Yeah, we I'm have a say. commentator that says, if we're, if we're in the new heaven and new earth, then uh, Satan's chain is too long. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> The guy said, really, this is what we had to look forward to? What's going on now? This is this is what the promise is? No, we know it's not. So the answer, just to finalize that question, is there will be no doubt in anyone's mind that Christ has returned and that this has all begun. We're not going to be like wondering if it happened or not. Yeah, and as, and as said, we're going to be getting into this here in just a bit, but it's called the preterist view. And that's where this is spiritualized. It's not... Uh, not little at all. And that there's a whole group of people, Bible studies and very intelligent men and women that believe that, that it's all spiritualized. And we'll, we're going to touch, touch base on that. But that was what I think she was referring to is, you know, it's already passed. It's not coming in the future. So who do you think Daniel is asking the question to explain what's happening? 
Say, say it again. I don't know. I, I, I don't said, know. I don't know. Okay. From what we get out of most commentators, I tend to agree. Uh, if you remember the book of Revelation and John was called up to heaven in a vision, uh, we have some commentators that he was physically transformed there. It wasn't a vision. I'm not going there and try to get there. But Daniel is in this same vision, and he's given a glimpse of heaven, and he's the vision almost puts him in virtual reality, put it that way, and he's able to communicate with the people in heaven. And so this is probably one of the angels that he's asking, maybe an archangel. So there's, there's a representative there in his vision that he's able to go ask. And so it's a little strange. He says, well, how can you see that in a vision? And look, when you look at technology and what we do with virtual reality today, don't think God has virtual reality, can bring us up and get us to look at this. That Daniel is actually, I think, in the presence of heaven in a virtual reality, and he's able to ask some angelic being, what's the interpretation of all this? That's just my two cents worth. Well, it's pretty much in keeping what happens to John in Revelations, huh? Absolutely, I agree. Did you ask somebody standing there? I don't know if it was an angel or somebody that was, I don't know, like already a human that was already, I don't yeah. know, getting in heaven. Because it referred to him, don't kneel, I'm, I'm a man like you, or something like that, I'm a person like you. I don't know. Yeah. It, it's hard to say de definitively, but it, he's asking a question. I, I do think it has to be somebody who knows. The, what's going on and it has to be it, is it just any angel it's probably a, a archangel you know it might be even gabriel who knows all right it could have been moses huh no i guess not yeah. no i don't know about those orders yeah. so um if you just remember this at the end so he told him to make known the interpretation so these this is the interpretation coming here verses 17 through 20 those great beasts, which are four, are four kings which arise out of the earth. But the saints of the Most High shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever and ever and ever. Excuse me. Then I wish to know the truth about the fourth beast, which was different from all the others, exceedingly dreadful, with its teeth of iron and its nails of bronze, which devoured broken pieces and trampled the residue with its feet. And the ten horns which were on its head and the other horn which came up before which three fell, namely that horn which had eyes and a mouth which spoke pompous words, whose appearance was greater than his fellows. So my question is, what does the fourth beast represent? And just go ahead. You know what we talked about last week. What does this fourth beast represent? The iron of the legs, what did that represent? Rome. So I want to show you, I got the slides out of, out of um, order and I should have done this, but I want to show you this slide. So if you remember the statue, um, we had the golden head we thought was Babylon, the silver, which is the Medo-Persian, the bronze, which is the Greek empire, the Rome is the iron, um, and then the iron and clay. Some people feel that it's Europe this is Europe from, from, the, from the end of Rome's reign to present, okay? Um, when we have the beasts, they, they describe these beasts. There's not a beast that they have down here, although this one seems like it's taking place down here. So this is one person's interpretation. But we had, a, I think this all came from one person who was really out there and we had never heard it before, so we thought we'd share it. So he was like, he was someone saying, that this had not happened yet. So the, the, these beasts did not represent these kingdoms that had already happened. They were future kingdoms. So they proposed that the lion with eagles, like the United States has eagles on it as its main creature, and England, Great Britain has lions. It's on the, the, the we call it yeah. the, the coat of arms uh, in Britain, 
So they, they said, he was saying that that could be US or Great Britain. Now, if we take current, if he's, this is current day beings, um, it can be, they say it could be one of two things. It's either gonna be this European grouping of nations or it's gonna be an Islamic nation. And there was a lot of support by a group. I mean, it wasn't the broadest, it wasn't the most uh, accepted, but that, that these beasts could represent an Islamic um, kingdom, uh, group of kingdoms. So they said, okay, well, I don't even know how they came up with Iraq, but okay, they've decided to make the lion Iraq. The then the bear, well, okay, and, you know, when I, was, when I was trying to guess, oh, what's he gonna make the bear? Well, that was pretty easy for me to guess. Well, what do you, what'd you guess? Well, the same thing, I've already got it here. I said, oh, the bear's what? The bear's gonna be Russia? Because we know they, in our modern time, you equate it with a bear. But for some reason, he's decided it could be Russia or it could be Iran, okay? And then the leopard, Germany. Well, where did he come up with Germany? Why is it Germany and not China or, or some other big power? Um, so the leopard, they chose Germany, um, but he said maybe it could be Turkey as the third portion of um, the Islamic nation. And then the last beast um, would be the Antichrist in the final kingdom. And that would either be this European nation grouping um, which most people feel that this is a European grouping, or it would be um, uh, these, these future or a Muslim grouping. Um, I think Dave and I feel like that, that the interpretation is very clearly aligning Daniel 7 and Daniel's vision with Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar's vision in Daniel 2. So we think the fourth beast represents Rome, which was never fully defeated. It kind of just faded away. It wasn't trounced or taken over by other ones. That's why there's this lingering remnant and it can come back as iron and clay. So it's gonna be a mixed, not very strong, it's gonna be a loosely clumped um, kingdom and not the powers, the empires that were from the past. Yeah, and I think they're most, as it has said, by vast majority, the commentators, I'm talking about old commentators, 200, 300 year old commentators, by far the majority is, these are past kingdoms in our present day. They're future kingdoms to Daniel. They haven't existed, they haven't gone yet. They haven't even come into existence, but they're past, pres they're past kingdoms to us in our society. That's the vast majority of where it falls. But one argues pretty strongly that the iron legs it's not Rome, it's actually the, the Muslim nations and that there will be 10 Muslim nations that come up. So the 10 toes and the 10 horns are gonna be coming out of the Muslim nations. They won't be coming out of a new made Rome and it won't be coming from a Jewish heritage at all. So anyway, it's interesting there's not enough support for that, but I bring it up because as we're trying to present these things so that you have both sides of everything that we are, we're able to deliver. And you know, I was like, well, good luck with that with the Islamic nations getting 10 of them to come together. I mean, I lived in Iran. Iran absolutely hated Iraq. You never could find out why. They just absolutely hated it just by the virtue of it being next to them um, and the, then the different factions fighting and constantly, I, I, and then Saudi Arabia is so different from any of the others and Turkey, oh my goodness, it doesn't fit in with any of them. Um, and so I, 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 I can't imagine a unified confederation of Islamic nations, but anything's possible. Yeah, and the, what they argue is obviously a unified European uh, nation is coming together. You have the European Union, uh, the, the Europe nations you know, were part of all the Roman Empire. Britain and Germany and France and Spain and Greece, all those were part of the Roman Empire. And they didn't go away. They just went off on their own rule. So it's like here in the United States, all of our states became independent countries and it was no longer the United States. That's kind of how you view the Roman Empire. The head of it just went away and all of them became separate countries. And so they think that's what this really represents and it comes back. There's an interesting thing here that I'm, I'm gonna to touch base on is that 
why do you think the fourth beast, and this is, this is a challenge, when we get into, when we did Daniel 2, we had four distinct kingdoms that we thought were gone, or where the Roman Empire no longer existed. And then the 10th kingdom was iron and clay toes, there were 10 toes, which corresponds to the 10 horns. And then you had Christ as the stone cut without hand, that crushed the feet and the toes and the whole statue fell down. We only have four beasts here, not five. And obviously the fourth beast might be a new revived Rome and may include the old Rome. And that's the only way to look at it if it is really a new, uh, new Rome. Uh, but it has claws of bronze. And the Roman Empire didn't do much with bronze. It was the Greek Empire that treasured bronze. Bronze was everywhere. Bronze uh, shields and weapons. Roman's Empire was mostly iron. It was stronger. It was harder. Uh, they threaded over their people with it. So why do you think? Why do you think if this is a Roman Empire, it would have bronze claws? Well. I'd like to just throw a comment out on that. Uh, not that, but things you've said in the last five minutes, but that empire that's toward the end that doesn't have an animal related to it, uh, I'm just throwing this out, could be the Ottoman Empire, which was a vast empire that expanded as much time or more time than even the Roman Empire. When you start out, you start out with Babylon, which is relatively small. It grew the Persian, Medo-Persian Empire. It encompassed Babylon and grew. You get to Greece, Alexander, his empire encompassed both of those and more. The Ottoman Empire, come, well, you have Rome, which basically encompassed all that and a little more. And then you had the Ottoman Empire, which overshadowed all of that most of Rome. Now, when you talk about the European countries, Germany and north of that, even England, the Roman Empire basically didn't consist of that. The Holy Roman Empire sort of took over all of Rome. But the Roman Empire really stopped short of Germany. It was the southern part of Europe. And it they used to fight the Germans or the Germanic, or the barbarians they call them, which were mostly German descent. I forget exactly how that comes a little bit from the north side of Europe, northeast. But the Ottoman Empire speaks of what you're saying about the Muslim or Islamic world. And it, it basically, it, it fits that description is the revive the, re, the revival of all these other kingdoms, not just the revived Roman Empire, but all these kingdoms we just talked about are all under the Ottoman Empire. So if we take all the Arab states, uh, which would be where all the Ottoman Empire was, and they revive or come back or have some type of this is that last kingdom. That's really fit. really. Interesting yes. observation. And Charlie, you're giving me lots of uh, homework. So I am going to go see if we can find anything about that because that's really a fascinating thought that nobody else brought up. So I really like to, uh, I'll go get some more info on that and try to find out more about why they're not mentioning the Ottoman Empire. I mean, it's a really uh, good, good I thought. haven't found much on it in the last four or five years, but it does it, come up a little bit. Right, and the only thing I can think of off the top of my head is there was never, to my knowledge, and you correct me because I might be speaking completely out of ignorance, but there was never a, a, an emperor or a king over all of them at one time that ruled like Caesar ruled over the Roman Empire. That there is uh, commentators that differentiate between the Roman Empire and the Holy Roman Empire as being two different empires. What we were able to comprehend a lot of these uh, uh, nations around Germany, the, uh, what were they called? The, 
Oh, they, they have odd names. They have names of it. But yeah. anyway, they came in along with the uh, Holy Roman Empire. They weren't defeated. They were just looking for protection up under the umbrella. Again, that's just pure history. We went into a little bit of that, but we didn't get into a great depth on that. So that's a good point to bring up. We'll do a little bit more research for next week. Um, I'm just going to go ahead and I'm not going to ask out what do all four of these beasts represent together. I'm just going to kind of recap because we've discussed this already that we feel that the interpretation given by the angel, if that's what it was, pretty clearly points that these four beasts go back and substantiate or refer back to Nebuchadnezzar's dream about the statue. Um, one thing we want to notice, and I'll point it out, we pointed out last week, I'll point it out again, is Nebuchadnezzar's dream was man's view of the kingdoms. It was this glorious, big, um, colossal statue of gold, uh, pre precious metals of gold, silver, bronze. Um, it was glorious and bright and whatever. Then we have Daniel's interpret or, uh, dream or vision in chapter seven, and really Nebuchadnezzar's was man's idea of these, um, these kingdoms, but Daniel, I think, is getting God's interpretation of these kingdoms as bloodthirsty, violent beasts that tear things apart and go around. Um, the just detestable beasts that he looks at the kingdoms of man that way um, and and that and that's what we're seeing. Why we see it in two different forms: man's view through Nebuchadnezzar and God's view through um, Daniel. Um, Daniel's interpretation. Mm -hmm. All right. Next set of verses: twenty-one through twenty-two. We're going to try to get through this tonight. I know we're we're it, it's okay because we'll just start over next week. So I'm not worried about it. Uh, yeah, good stuff. Yeah, good, good stuff. stuff. I was watching, and then the same horn was making war against the saints and prevailing against them. Ooh, that ain't good news. Until the Ancient of Days came, and a judgment was made in favor of the saints of the Most High, and the time came for the saints to possess the kingdom. So we, we have a picture here of this little horn, if you re remember that name, the small horn that came up out of the 10 horns, which destroyed three of the other kingdoms, uh, made war against the saints and was winning. And this, this made war really means persecuting, killing. I mean, it's, it, just, it wasn't like a war we're thinking of. They were completely put up under the authority. And if you remember Book of Revelation, if you don't worship uh, the Antichrist and his statue, or you don't... You don't take the mark, you can't do business. If you don't worship, you're killed. And so this is the type of persecution that sounds like what's going on. And when you look at the interpretation of the Aramaic and what it's saying, that's what's really happened. War is probably not the best for this. But who do you think are the saints that it's talking about? Tribulational believers. That's one one uh, answer, and I think, in my opinion, I, I tend to agree with you, Lane, more than any. Uh, some thinks it's the uh, Jews that have been uh, converted, that it's well, the Jews. Yeah. Uh, others thinks it's all the saints, and it's happening prior to the tribulation. That's bad news, because I thought we were raptured out before the tribulation. So I'm not sure I agree with that, but there's com some commentators that says this is a promise that we're going to be persecuted before the tribulation ever starts. Uh, we will. Jesus made clear that we will have tribulations. We will be hated by the world. He made that clear. But I do think what this is talking about is the tribulation saints, as you said. I don't think it's the church. And I don't think it's redeemed Jews. Uh, and I don't think it's anything else in that area. Uh, and that's that's the, the way I look at it. Because we're going to get to something in just a minute. This next question. Why I think that. I'm going to let her ask it and answer it. So this is a question. I'm thinking Robert might have a good thought about this. Because of how he knows the New Testament. I mean, knows the scripture. But this says, 
Jesus says the gates of hell could not prevail against us. So he states that. So is this a contradiction that Daniel is seeing a prophecy that the, the horn will wage war against the saints? Is that a contradiction? I don't think it is. No? <clears throat> so this, the answer goes back, as best as we could determine, the answer goes back to what Dave was saying, is that there are different types, of, there's different saints in the Bible. There are Old Testament saints. There are um, the church age saints. There's going to be the post-tribulation or the tribulation saints. And so, as Dave already answered, these questions probably could have been put together as one question, um, that the gates of hell aren't coming against the church, but the church will be gone. The church will be raptured out. Um, the gates of hell will be waging war against, I think, the post-trib saints. Yeah, the tribulation saints. And this was brought up by one of the commentators. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but we are promised in Psalms, Psalms 91, uh, it's called the safety of abiding in the presence of God. That's kind of the summary. I'm going to read part of it. And, and again, the reason why I think this is not us, uh, not that we're exempt from tribulation, but I, tribulations are bad things. I'm not saying that at all. But this war against the saints by the Antichrist, I don't think impacts us. Uh, even though we're at war right now spiritually, Wayne, as you said, there's a spiritual warfare going on to win us over by Satan through deception every second, every day. So I'm not saying that spiritual warfare is not going on. That, that's true. But Psalm 91 says, He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide up under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress. My God in, in Him I will trust. Surely He will deliver me from the snare of my father and from the perils of my pestilence. He shall cover me, you with his feathers, and under his wing you should take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and your buckle. He shall not be afraid of terror by night, nor the errors that fly by day, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So this is this is God's promise to protect us, to take him under shield. And he's he, Daniel's saying he's given us over. He's he's basically saying he's making a war against the saints and he's prevailing. And again, where I'm going back to is what Lane said. I really think, while that is probably a minority agreement among the commentators, by the way, I do think it's probably the, the tribulation sense. Yeah, I, I, I would clarify that. I, I'm, I'm thinking after reading this in some detail that Daniel's a Jew. He's being shown and spoken to about, spoken to about Jewish things. And I think these saints here should really be in the context of this passage looked at as Israel. And it was Israel that's promised the kingdom. Yeah. Well, I see Israel written all over the passage now. Yeah, and I, I agree with you. That was one of the uh, options that it was the nation Israel. But the nation Israel, you got to be careful with that. And while I agree that that's probably a, a valid option, is that the nation Israel will be persecuted during the tribulation. We know that. And until they accept Christ, Christ won't be coming back. But also, Jew, there's a lot of Jews that are already Christians. And if they're already Christians, they should be, they should be raptured out along with the rest of the Christians. So mm -hmm. I have some trouble with it being just that group, even though I think it includes them. I don't you think there's a right answer, and I don't think it's, it's something we need to really debate a lot over, but I think it could be any of those things we talked about. Uh, you bet, uh, we did have commentators that thought it was Israel, the nation Israel. You've had 144,000 Jewish evangelists operating when this is going on prior to this. Mm -hmm. So there's going to be plenty of saved Jews in Israel at the time. I say plenty. Uh, Plenty could be 50 or plenty could be 500 or 5,000. That I don't know. But there will be saved Jews. <clears throat> right. But the 144,000, God marks them and they go untouched. And, and say the 144,000 through the tribulation period 
How many are left at the end? 144,000. But it said, it doesn't say it's, they, they, untouched means they're not going to be killed, but it doesn't mean they're not going to suffer. Yeah, they're going to be persecuted. Right. That's true. Yeah. yeah. So all good points. Anything else before we move on? Well, I'm well, hoping that we're out of time actually. And so I think I'm proposing that we continue this next week because we have a lot left. This was a lot of stuff and we knew it was a lot, but it was really good discussion. And I think we probably, to do it justice, we should stop here and pick this up next week. You can do that. I was going to make one comment on the uh, gates of hell prevailing and the horn prevailing against the saints. It's um, sort of like an old saying, you can lose a battle, but win the war. Right. Um, for instance, the, well, you erased it, but, you know, the gates of hell would be kind of looked at as the war, whereas the whatever you said, um, the comments go on, can't read it. Oh, but, yeah. I'm sorry, let me read it. Just let me give you that. It's um, Jesus said the gates of hell would not prevail against us. So, how is the horn prevailing over the okay? Spirit? The horn is like a battle, okay? It, it, he's pushing like throughout time. Uh, Israel, Christians, I mean, look at the Christians at the time of Christ, they were greatly pushed on. I mean, they were persecuted left and right, being murdered left and right, but the gates of hell did not prevail. I mean, it just blew up from there. So these little setbacks, like right there, it's kind of like a battle. It's being, looks like it's being lost, but at the end, you know, boom, blows up on them so it's kind of like it, it looks like you're losing a battle but the war is far from over and we win the war good point yeah and, and we, we'll get into as we finish this next week you know the the horn that we're talking about uh is unquestionably satan i mean of uh, the antichrist yeah. powered by satan so this little horn almost all commentators are unanimous even though they have different views where where, where they're originating where he's originating from that little horn is is the Antichrist. And, and again, we haven't gotten the Antichrist yet, nor have we got the one world kingdom, nor have we got the treaty done with Jerusalem and Israel yet to build, rebuild the temple. So we've got a bunch of stuff that hasn't happened yet. And so we, we get into that next week. Uh, but we this is really, really good interchange. And this is this is just beautiful interchange. We appreciate it. Any other comments on this before? We'll finish up this chapter next week. And maybe start on chapter maybe. eight. We'll see. But we still have quite a bit to go on this on this chapter. So we'll, we'll see what we do next week. Uh, we will be out of town next week. We don't anticipate having any internet problems, but we are going to be in Panama City. We've been there before and did it out of there. We were okay. So we think we'll be fine. We'll let you know if we run into problems Monday when we test things when we're there. But it shouldn't be an issue. Just letting you know that that's just a possibility. Any other closing comments? I got one. Yeah. I, I just did a little quick search on Logos, and I thought it was the case, but I wasn't sure. That reference to about the gates of hell should not prevail against it, that was actually a statement made by Jesus regarding the church, not Israel. Hmm. So I'll tell you, Peter, on this rock, I'll build my church. And the gate. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I agree. It's the church. Uh, I, I didn't say either way. I just know yeah. oh, Jesus had said that, but yet we see saints. And so I guess the answer would be perhaps, again, as one of our questions was, there are different saints. So, so and, and I think that was kind of the answer to that question. Jesus said that. How is it that the little horn is... Um, prevailing and it's because there are different saints and so that's a good point yeah. um that that jesus was talking to the church i believe these saints probably are the jewish tribulation saints that are uh, that are being persecuted by satan in the end time or and does. the old testament saints i don't think are part of it yeah and there, there's there's one that actually said these are old testament uh jewish people that you know that will come up to judgment and they, they will be entered into heaven based upon, you know, their belief in the coming of the Messiah because they never had an opportunity to see the Messiah. I mean, they don't know the new Testament. All they know is the old Testament. 
we won't go there. You could you can go down a deep road here, but Lane, I think the things you're saying are all valid. It's all things that we need to take into account. And that so. just goes to the beauty of not taking scripture out of context because somebody could say, oh, this is a contradiction. And now when you go back and see, oh, now I clearly see that maybe we should have done a little bit more in that and say, well, no, that's exactly why this is in it because this is the church and we really don't feel like Satan is prevailing. The little horn is not prevailing over the church. I think, I really do think the little horn is prevailing over the tribulation scene. Any other thoughts? This is good stuff, guys. We're good. Let's close in prayer and we'll see you next week. And dear Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for this word. Thank you for this knowledge. I, I pray that as we bring it together, we're going to have an understanding of this book that you need us to have. We want to be prepared. We want to be able to discuss this. We want to be able to share who you are and, and how valid the Bible is just because um, Daniel has been proven by history and by non-biblical authors. Um, the events of Daniel have been proven. And so we just thank you and praise you for this, this gift of your book and this knowledge. And I just pray that we would use this, that we would build your kingdom, that we would be, um, this is interesting things. These are things we can bring up and talk to people who maybe don't know you. And as we begin to talk to them, they may begin to know who you are. And I just pray you would use this as a, as a venue to, to spread your kingdom. Please help us to be involved in that, especially in this dire age. I pray for this nation. I pray for the turmoil going on. Um, you have a plan and you are in control. We know that. And so we just pray your will be done and we would be your willing um, instruments. In Jesus' name, amen. Again, thank you all so much for your comments, for your interchange, and for participating.